is for the little uh, delay technology with all the AI's help. We're still struggling with that. Um, I'm happy to be here with Emir today. If you don't know who Emir is, he has a great account on X. He's now writing as well on Seeking Alpha. All those links will be down in the description. Great pieces, probably one of the best you're going to find on Palantir, on PayPal, on Virtue as well, if you're interested in that one. Um, but in this hopefully video- Hopefully more to come. Yeah, hopefully more to come. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about Palantir and PayPal as well. I believe it's your, those two companies make up pretty much the majority of your portfolio right now. Yep, yep. All right. Um, let's see if everybody can tell us if you can hear us correctly. That would be great. I think we, I think I'm hearing myself. So it means the sound is working. Um, yeah. So let's start with a little uh, intro. Um, you've now had the time to to look at Palantir's earnings report, uh, 10K. What were your biggest, uh, let's say, takeaways, good and bad? Well. Uh... 300 years before Christ, no, I'm just kidding, you know, when it comes to Palantir's current earnings, the actual results or the financial performance for the past quarter isn't really that important to me. It's all about gaining insight into what the future may hold. I mean, we all have these grand ideas of what Palantir can accomplish in the future. Mm -hmm. So. It's more that I focus on trying to gain insight and hints into what the future may hold. And uh, in regards to Palantir's Q4 and year as a whole, we can clearly see some uh, trends in the right direction in terms of what AIP will bring uh, to the company. Um, prior to Q4, we didn't really have any good ideas of what that might may be i mean carp routinely said we have no pricing strategy we're only yep. striving to gain market share and as an investor and um, trying to project what that might mean you're like what <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh of course one of the main goals was to fix their sales cycle i mean they had huge issues dating back probably 20 years since <laughs> yeah. they launched. I mean, they didn't really have a satisfactory go to market. Uh, we saw them struggling to gain customers, um, to gain market share. And I think they have a lever now uh, of how they can grow and not only grow. I mean, the efficiency of a boot camp is, I mean, it's unprecedented. I mean, I had to revise a lot of assumptions in my models in regards to just margins because running a boot camp for 10 potential customers over a one to three day period, like across the globe, running multiple ones. I mean, it's so efficient. Different <clears throat> cash, industry as well. Yeah. And cash wise, I mean, it's insane. And also Palantir's main issue was always like, well, if we just got our product into the hands of customers, they would see the value but they weren't getting the product into customers' hands. I mean, these boot camps uh, routinely reported on LinkedIn of attendees. They're like mind blown, like, oh my God, we accomplished so much in one to three days. And you can see this. I mean, I don't track it uh, as much, but there are a lot of passionate Palantir fans that post like every single detail that <laughs> reaches the internet. It's out on X. Uh, for example, Lord the Grim on Twitter mm -hmm. is great. He reports a lot and it's very diverse. As you mentioned, it's not just one industry they're focused on. I mean, it's vast across many industries. And we know that Palantir from their 10 case from the beginning, they are striving to be the operating system of industries across many industries. So I think Q4 held a lot of that. Uh, well, what were your takeaways? I mean, if you don't want me to monologue for 20 minutes. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I, I've had uh, Arnie here last week. So we, we did also talk about that. The, I think. Um, the monologue king, Arnie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, may, I um, make fun, fun of him in private for that. <laughs> so. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, it's someone that has been following the company very closely, writes about it every week. So um, of course, I mean, he has a lot, a lot, a lot to say, but uh, no, I, 
I was expecting, I mean, after everything we've been hearing, we on X, we see a lot of information that probably a lot of people do not see. So I was expecting reacceleration in growth, but I was not expecting the results that we have already seen right now. Of course, the year over year results, as we've seen, 70%. Okay, that's because last year was extremely an extremely weak quarter, but still, um, the guidance for, for 2024 was still above what, what I was expecting. Um, so yeah, good, good reacceleration. Now the question is how, how much, how much further can this continue? Are we going to see an Nvidia type of, of growth cycle right now, where every single quarter is going to be quite incredible quarter over quarter growth and, and year over year, uh, remains to be seen. Cause as I've discussed with Arnie, if you look at how much revenue this company generates, still, still very, 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 very small, um, compared to, to the overall industry, compared to total addressable market. I mean, we're still far away from generating a billion dollars a quarter. So I think that's very important for, for shareholders to, to remember when talking about potential price targets in the future, potential, I don't know how big this company can become. Let's, let's first reach a billion a quarter and then uh, let's see uh, what happens next. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's the main thing I mentioned in the beginning. It's not so much the financial implications of like Q4, Q3 of 2023. I don't think we've seen an acceleration in revenue growth at all, uh, actually. I think the increase is in customer acquisition. As you know, um, the higher cu customer count you grow, the more difficult it will be to actually grow percentage wise and they've yep. re-accelerated for real as of Q4 in 2023 mm -hmm. and that's when actually AIP starts to kick in but if you look if you break out the revenue I mean there's no revenue impact it's all in line from what I would expect without AIP so as you mentioned are we gonna see like an Nvidia type acceleration I really think that and I don't think it's here yet I think uh, Carp isn't lying when he says that there isn't no real pricing strategy I mean he mentions that He's talking to everyone that can offer up 1 million for the product mm -hmm. and they're bo booking them to AIPs. But um, the revenue recognition isn't like you sign the contract and you pay now. It's not, it's not like you check out at a website us using PayPal. I mean, yep. so I, I don't think we're seeing the impact yet. I think we're going to see a massive acceleration. I'm expecting that. And uh, that's why I get so confused when they mention in the call, like, yeah, we grew U.S. commercial revenue 70% year over year. Uh, Q4 of 2022 was negative. I mean, they lost re revenue compared to Q3 in 2022. So it was a very weak year. And then uh, you accredit that to AIP and you credit that to uh, the boot camps. And I'm not seeing that at all. I don't think it's uh, boot camp or AIP. I, don't, I just think it's in line with what I would be expecting of Palantir gaining like recognition and growing organically without um, leveraging bootcamp. So I think we're in to see some massive acceleration in revenue recognition, and I don't think it's here yet. But the actual increases we are seeing are in customer acquisition. That's the really impressive part as of Q4, like we're actually accelerating for real. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, as well, I've talked about Army with that. I think we're going to see the impact of of these acquisitions in some time, um, like you said, it's not a PayPal checkout where you pay and and we, we see the results di directly. Um, but even so, I mean, last quarter the deals that were closed have at least a hundred uh, one million dollars, or at one hundred and three uh, thirty seven at least five million and twenty one at least ten million. Um, it's nice to see. It's nice to see. But yeah, I do still think we're we're still at the start of, of something pretty big, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah and that shows up in the uh, performance obligations, which grew mm -hmm. like 380% year over yep. year, like something crazy. So that's revenue to be recognized. But also remember that Palantir's core strategy historically has been to uh, be at a loss to acquire a customer and then over time scale them into more solutions, have them spend yep. more. So not only are we leveraging customer acquisition growth with boot camps and AIP, I think once these, I mean, they, they mentioned the deal spread, I think those are going to grow uh, as time moves on. 
they don't present it anymore but we used to have um, <clears throat> we used to have uh, what were they called uh the sometimes i hate that uh, english isn't my native language mm. they had the cohort slides cohort oh, okay. slides yeah, yeah, yeah in yeah. the pre presentations and you could see like i think carp mentioned like in uh uh, yearly earnings call, like you see the Phoenix rise and then they presented the cohort slides and you could see like how year over year, the previous year cohort is like growing massively as time yeah. moves on. So yeah, I, th I think um, we're in for some interesting times moving forward and it's just now starting to actually happen. I mean, we had expectations of this happening. I mean, people are throwing out like Palantir to 1 trillion, whatever, but no one can tell you like, how will it happen? Uh, I think one trillion <laughs> might be a ways off still, but we're certainly starting to see like the ladder, like we're, we're starting to see how they will start to accomplish that. Um, so yeah, those were my key takeaways from Q4, uh, from Palantir's earnings. Uh, sure, the revenue wasn't that impressive. The guidance wasn't really that impressive. Uh, but I think they're sandbagging re revenue for the fiscal year. Uh, I think it's going to be something uh, approximately close to 30%, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps 35% of revenue growth for 2024. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be really impressive. Yeah, I agree. I think, I mean, again, we're just at the start of the year, last year, second second half of the year, what did they do? 500 boot camps or something like that. Um, I think 2024 probably going to see quite a lot more, which can, will probably translate um, into the numbers later on. Did you see anything that was like hmm, worrying? Not worrying, but maybe like a small thing that could have been better, or something that you would like to to see improve in the next coming quarters? I mean, no. But uh, <clears throat> what I'm expecting to see is. Another thing that should be the results of AIP and boot camps is a uh, margin expansion. We could see that in uh, Q4, for example, if you look at the cash flow margins, it they they report something like fifty percent their adjusted number. The actual number is not as impressive, but it's still very very high, uh, something like forty seven percent when I calculate it. Keep in mind that uh, customers usually. <clears throat> pay during the fourth quarter so that will always be a boost but still it's very impressive and i think i don't think people talk about it enough that the margins of their sales cycle i mean it's gonna the operating margins will increase a lot and i don't see people speak a lot about that i wish palantir would give us some more clarity in that regard uh but there are still uh, i mean a lot of question marks that haven't been uh, answered. For example, um, what well, one thing uh, it's, it's it's not related to Q4. It should we diverge yeah, from Q4? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, one thing that I've been struggling with uh, because I like to value businesses, and one thing that I've uh, struggled with is how do you value Palantir's global influence? I mean, they are present at every world stage. Mm -hmm. They're talking like at the most important conventions, uh, both uh, commercially and more importantly, militarily uh, across the globe. And how do you v value that? I mean, I had a conversation with, with Arnie where he said something like, uh, uh, it's qualitative, but you shouldn't pay for that. And I'm like, well, you should pay for everything that impacts cash flows. and global influence certainly does impact cash flows. I mean, uh, people have a hard time valuing intangibles, but uh, it's not that complex, actually. For example, brand recognition is mm -hmm. a common intangible across many brands, uh, I mean, across many companies, but it doesn't show up as a line item. So how do you value it? Well, it impacts cash flows where? In the margins. So if you say you have brand recognition, but your margins aren't better than the competitors, then you don't have brand <laughs> recognition, right? So this should show up in the margins, which also ties back to all the other margin uh, expansion ideas that I do have. 
but I'm struggling a little bit because we know that they used to hire a lot of uh, higher ups within the US government, UK government, I mean, globally. But I'm not sure if we are seeing that global influence play out yet. So I'm having a little hard time. I mean, CARP doesn't attend all these events purely out of the good of his heart, even though I'm sure that's part of it, <laughs> knowing CARP. Um, but they are present at every world discussion and uh, people have voting power that attend those. So I think uh, that's also like an unknown, but it's really, I'm, I'm really curious about it. Do you have any thoughts about like Palantir's lobbying and how that might affect uh, us moving forwards? Um, I mean, I think in the United States, their position is, is already pretty strong. Maybe they like to play in the background and, and do things in the background. I mean, they've been doing this for 20 years. So I guess, I guess they know people that know people or they know the people directly, um, which is probably yeah. why government side is, is pretty key for them. With regards to global operations, yeah, in Europe, I mean, we've been hearing that it's, it's the weaker part. Um, but I do think, especially right now with everything that's happening, I do think that, the, I mean, if you hear Carp speak uh, abroad, I do think he's trying to make his point heard a bit more than, than before. Whether or not yeah. that will work remains to be seen. But uh, yeah, in the United States, I don't think that's, Maybe, maybe they can do a bit more because I mean the budget in the United States it's pretty it's pretty immense and I mean they've been talking about that not just him but uh, Palmer Lucky as well and other players have been talking about the fact that they just need to spend way more on, on software um, so yeah but, but, I mean we... but isn't it interesting that we we hear this from Carp at every event he's like uh, the U S is ahead of the rest of the world they're really slow mm -hmm. to adapt but if you have to guess. Uh, the previous three quarters, let, or let, let's say 2023 as a whole, do you think uh, Palantir's US segment has grown or shrunk? I the mean, government? They, no, no, uh, total revenue. Total? So I mean... government, he's complaining that only the US is spending, and commercially mm -hmm. he says that they're moving personnel out of Europe, for example, because companies aren't adapting, so I mean, it's, it should impact both. Yep. But the reality is that the U.S. segment has actually shrunk. So it, it makes me like wonder whenever Carp speaks, like, is there something like what are we missing? Because he, he doesn't say things randomly. I mean, he's been ranting about this fact, but uh, the U.S. segment has shrunk. I mean, I'm really <laughs> surprised. I mean, of course, commercially, they are focusing in the U.S., mm -hmm. but still the, the commentary applies to both. And yeah. Uh, they started the year at, let's see, 64% uh, was US. Uh, and by Q4, it was only 60%. So, I mean, the rest of the world is doing something. So, I mean, um, interesting <clears throat> thought experiment. I don't have any con conclusions, but I mean, I, j I just track like every KPI. And sometimes I really struggle to make sense of things in regards to Palantir, which also makes it like such an interesting company to follow because there are so many dynamics. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it is an election year. So I guess that plays a small part in, in decision making when it comes to contracts and stuff like that. So maybe that's one reason. Second might be maybe CARP, I mean, like we said before, things play out when we will see it in the numbers, it probably already happened way before for Palantir. So maybe that's, that's why he's projecting yeah. such, such confidence and um, because he's projecting a lot of confidence recently, way more than let's say a, a year and a half ago or so, yeah. um, he's way more comfortable speaking right now. So yeah, I think that's one reason, but yeah, there are still some question marks. Like I said, I mean, it's just one great quarter that we just had it, things might change in the next quarter I, if suddenly it's a, it's a down quarter i don't know if it, that will happen but we never know but yeah uh, just when you flip the coin one bad quarter doesn't change the whole thesis one great quarter doesn't change the whole thesis yeah, yeah. Uh, suddenly as well but uh yes, yeah we it's, about it's an interesting it it's all about gaining insight and hints about what the future may hold i mean mm -hmm. we all know palantir is nowhere near mature here so it's all about trying to understand the business and the company and where it's going. Um, 
<clears throat> I'm, I'm really curious about your take on the age old question. I mean, I haven't heard this in a while now, but this used to be on everyone's mind for a while, especially when Palantir was in the dumps. Should mm. Palantir spin off commercial from the government segment? Uh, and if they should, which would you rather own? Ooh, that's a good one. Because on one side, you've got the government, which is pretty, let's say, secure-ish, um, but doesn't grow as fast as the commercial. On the other side, you've got the commercial, can grow very fast, but might not be a as stable as you would like. Um, I still think no. I still think I'd like to own both of them. Um, but if I had to choose, probably go commercial because of the, the, the potential there. Um, would my answer be different a year and a half ago? Probably not, probably not. Um, even though one and a half a year ago, you would say, yeah, but government is way, way better. Cause I mean, it's stable. Look at commercial doesn't move, doesn't do anything. Why should we want that? Uh, it's like saying, it's like talking about other businesses, right? Google, huh? would you rather have YouTube alone or would you have, would you want to have Google search and YouTube and everything with that? Same with Amazon. I, AWS? I, I, I do want the YouTube and AWS. YouTube alone. <laughs> <laughs> I do want those. But yeah, no, actually, uh, I, I wouldn't mind AWS. I wouldn't mind AWS. Yeah, it's an interesting question that I just thought about randomly today after watching some ping pong videos. Don't don't ask me why. Pong five? <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, some ping pong videos. You know, table yeah. tennis. No, no, I know ping pong, a uh, big no, channel I don't on know, YouTube. Pong five. Uh, Adam yeah. Bobro, the the commentator, he makes great content. A oh. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> Um, I think the government is severely underestimated, and if it would be spun off, I think all the stock appreciation is in the commercial side. So I think the commercial side would be overvalued, and I think the go government side would be severely like deep value territory. Because yeah, currently. When, yeah, and when I project out revenues for both and do a sum of the parts, I see government growing faster than commercial and people would think like, oh my God, you were so crazy. Like, how can you say that government will grow faster than uh, commercial, especially considering that commercial is a smaller part, right? Mm -hmm. So it should uh, be able to grow faster, especially considering like all the AI hype. But I think if there is some truth to what Carp is hinting at, where the DOD starts to spend more on AI solutions, I mean, we have some different figures. CARP has said around 0.5% goes towards AI of the DOD budget, which is similar to what I can find when I try to like search the web of sources. And then we have Shiam saying it's more like 0.1%, but we know that he wants it to be at least 5%. So if I just ramp up the AI spend of the DOD budget, where I have Palantir keeping their current market share. So if we assume that 0.5% of the DOD budget is spent on AI, then Palantir has 25% of that, which makes you curious, mm -hmm. like who has the other 75%? Yeah. Like, what, what the hell? But yeah, so I, if I keep them at 25% market share, because I don't think they're going to shrink in that space, mm -hmm. in, in, in the defense uh, sense, uh, it's going to grow like somewhere around 29% Kager if I slowly, gradually add the basis points year over year. So by 2033, it's up to 5% that CARPS wants it to be. Mm -hmm. He says that they should start by like 1% and then add half a percent. I have it even slower than that. So just like my base case, I have a really slow ramp and it's still like 30% Kager. So I do something similar. I mean, I wish we had more data for the commercial side. For example, if we knew all the different industries AI spending, then we could just extrapolate the Palantir's market share and then just ramp it for a 10 year period yeah. to be lazy. So if we knew that, well, aviation uh, spend on AI is this much, and we know that Palantir has Skywise, for example, uh, in healthcare, they are powering X percent of all the beds and hospitals mm -hmm. in the US. If we knew how much of their spend was AI, we could just ramp that. And, and so forth and so forth. So if we could do that, we could get a really clearer picture of, okay, what does commercial growth look like in the future? Instead, we only have like global AI software market spend uh, projections. 
Palantir is like really low of that total, like less than 1%. But if I grow it to like 1% of global AI software spend by 2033, it's still lower than what the government will bring in. So that, that's also like some hints that I'm looking at each quarter that passes. I'm trying to look like, okay, do we have some more hints? Like, can we unlock more uh, information about what value the future holds for Palantir? So I think if they spun off, I would rather own the government. I think it's less, uh, I mean, it's at the current price. price. Yeah, sure. Like if yeah. you look at the, the currently trading price mm -hmm. and, if, and if you would spin off, let, let's say that it's a roughly 50, 50% 50 revenue split and cash flow and so forth. Of course, the yeah. government cu customers are spending way, way more per customer mm -hmm. than commercial, but let's assume 50, 50. I think most of the price is commercial expectations yeah. and not government. So I would rather own the government, but yeah, it's a fun thought experiment when it, when it comes to Palantir, just uh, dialing back and looking at like a lot of people were screaming for this. Now, no one seems to mention it anymore, but if it were to happen, then I would rather own the government uh, the way it stands right now. Yeah, no, fair point, fair point. Um, no, I do think that we are moving forward, especially with everything that we're hearing. I think, okay, maybe not 2024 again, election year. I think a lot of things are, are on hold, but yeah. next year, yeah, we could see things move quite quickly when it comes to, to the government side. Um, and then if not, then, then maybe, yeah, we should ask, ask some questions, but, uh, I mean, there is also the, the Titan contract that we're still waiting on. So I just uh, remembered my biggest gripe with Q4 and, uh, 2023 as a whole, <laughs> why are there only two analysts asking questions when there are over 15 covering Palantir? Yes, I was also, what, what, when I was listening to the earnings call, I was like, we're done already? What? Yeah, it's not only Q4, it's been this way for it's a long time. It's been this time. way, yeah, yeah. For over a year. I mean, they used to be really low, like uh, they used to have the uh, uh, William Blair guy, they used to have the Morgan Stanley guy, uh, like four or five at most. But it's, they, they've only scaled that down. Do, do you think they are gatekeeping analysts from like at, attending? Because I think it's really stupid. I want to know like answers as much to as a possible. lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. This like every earnings call is our chance as investors to gain more insight. Like ask the uncomfortable questions. Like there's no one to do that. They only have uh, Dan Ives. Dan Ives and Mariana. Yeah. Yeah. Mariana is respectable. She has good questions. She has deep understanding. She can ask the right questions. Dan Ives is just a fanboy. I, I think he's. I, I don't have a lot of. of res I don't have a lot of respect for Dan Ives. Yeah, especially when he called like uh, C three AI the LeBron of AI. The LeBron, yeah. I mean, he's uh, he's doing his job, which is gain attention and gain clients for his fund. But as an analyst, I have really low respect for him. Fun that he talks about Palantir often. That's great. I, I think he has some understanding of what they do. Uh, I think he talks to potential clients and current clients to gain some understanding, but I'm not expecting him to ask some hard hitting questions during quarters. So what is the reason do you think that more analysts aren't attending, especially because it's such a hyped name right now? There are a lot of analysts covering it, uh, but we're not seeing anything. Uh, I'm really stumped by that. I'm disappointed every quarter. I'm like, is this going to be the quarter? Like, are they going to let more people in? And then I'm like, yeah, a few retail questions. And then Mariana and then I, uh, that's it. I'm like, what's, what's going on here? I mean, I've never seen this. I, have you ever seen this with any company? No, that's the thing. I don't, my question is, is that even allowed to not let analysts in the earnings score? I don't, I don't know. Maybe the analysts themselves don't know. I don't know, don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. If it's uh, I don't know because I, I would love to have more analysts. The more analysts, the better. People underestimate, even if you don't like what they're saying. At least they're giving you some some information that maybe you didn't find, so you can work with that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I found it very very interesting that they only had two analysts. Maybe analysts don't want to speak to Alex Carr because they know he's going to scream or bang the table or say something. I don't know. Um, but yeah. Would be nice to have more analysts because also with with the earnings presentation i mean i would love to get more information in those documents i would love to have more information everywhere i hate when they remove stuff without adding something else 
to get a bit more context. Um, it's not just Palantir, it's a lot of other companies as well. Suddenly they give us another metric and remove another. I was like, eh, why do you do that? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's it's strange. I don't know how that works with regards to analysts and earnings calls. Yeah, um, I really hope that they let on more analysts in the future. We don't know the reason. I think uh, it would be a great question to ask them during earnings call. Like, <laughs> why is it so empty in here? Uh, what do you think about the current uh, pricing of the stock? Um, what is it today? Still uh, probably up because everything was up today, like that crazy. Yeah, twenty three. So you you'll have to tell me. Twenty three dollars and sixty cents today. So, yeah. Um, I mean, it's nice. <laughs> it's nice to see it up. Um, am I adding right now? I've not added um, since after the earnings call. Went up quite a lot, very fast, waiting for a pullback because the market itself as a whole, I mean, the whole AI thing has pulled everything up quite fast. So I'm currently waiting to see if there are some some red days out there um, to give us yeah, a Yeah, you know, more. I was, um, I have, when Palantir was around seven bucks, six bucks, I had 100% of my portfolio in Palantir mm -hmm. because I saw that something is broken here. Then when it went up, my fair valuation of Palantir was something like 10 to $12, depending on like as the quarters pro progressed. But I was always so behind on the stock price. I was like, no, I mean, it's too overvalued right now. And then uh, I wrote my first Seeking Alpha article on Palantir. And I really gave my valuation model like a, a rerun. I'm like, okay, what am I missing here? Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to model in the expectations from the government and from the co commercial space, as I mentioned earlier in, in this talk. And then I arrived at something like 18 bucks. And I'm like, oh my God, it's actually undervalued like day to day. I mean, it's been to 20, back to 15, 20. I mean, yeah. it was trading sideways. So I was like, well, it is undervalued. Should I add? But at the time I had a better prospect, so I didn't. And now the stock price moved up as I expected it to. I mean, I rated it a buy in my Seeking Alpha article at 18. It was below 18. Now we went to like 25 and I'm like, are we overvalued now? So I valued it again. I took Q4 into consideration. I uh, expanded the margins. Mm -hmm. I uh, like altered the model according to my new expectations, especially con considering the like sales efficiency of AIP bootcamps yeah. and stuff like that. And uh, I arrive at something like, $22. So roughly where it's trading now, let's say it's 23 today. So I'm like, okay, well, it could be fairly valued. Uh, should I add here or no? And I'm like, it's a really difficult question because as, 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 on one hand, you want to be part of the hype, right? You're like, mm -hmm. well, stocks are going to the moon or should you like just fall back? Like, no, I'm going to be discipline. This is how I invest. I look at intrinsic value. I get a quote and that's it. I don't follow charts every day, but am I missing out? And that's like really difficult as an investor for now. I'm not buying. I'm, I think it's fairly valued here. I would need to have it to drop below intrinsic value to be interested. But I mean, it's a difficult question. I think a lot of people are scared to enter into companies and making mistakes like, well, it's already ran up. Like I'm going to wait for a pullback that never comes. Like when Palantir went to 15, 16 and my fair value was 12, I'm like, well, no, I'm going to be disciplined here. But there's always the risk that you're missing something. And I was missing something because when I revalued it, my intrinsic value was 18. So I don't know. I think it's a interesting question to ask yourself as an investor like, are you disciplined enough? Uh, do you understand what you're buying at what price? Do you know what, you, what, what you're getting for the price you're paying and stuff like that? Uh, I think it's fairly valued here, but yeah, I'm, I'm also holding back. I'm uh, in the same boat as you currently, but yeah, still interesting. Yeah, I mean, because we it, it's a company that in three months time, things can change, right? Three months exactly. time, you model it again, yeah, uh, intrinsic exactly. value suddenly 
10 20 percent higher we don't know or lower yeah Again, you know, we don't know uh, it's a very interesting do you know about aswat uh, damodaran he's a professor at is, N yeah. N nyu he's called like the dean of valuation goes on mm -hmm. cnbc great uh, mm -hmm. youtube channel he puts out every lecture he values companies he puts it out publicly like he discusses he told he, he said something very interesting in regards to tesla i think i uh, know nvidia 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 yeah so yeah. you probably know what i'm th thinking about yes uh, the quote, <laughs> that you have to in your valuation you have to account for in this case nvidia being at the top of the next big thing like you expect them to be there and then you have to credit some value to that we know that palantir is like one of the best software companies in the world we have seen them adapt to like AIP boot camps wasn't even a thing by Q1, like mm -hmm. not, nothing. And then there was this huge AI hype and then they're on, on top of it immediately. So you could uh, give uh, Palantir some value purely to the fact that you know that they're going to be on top of that trend. You know that they're yep. going to capture market share. You know that they're going to be aware of what's happening in their industries, which is, I mean, really vast. They cover something like... I don't know the latest figure, but I mean, we're talking like 50 in industries or more. I mean, something insane. So yeah, really interesting that we are probably missing something and you should add some va value just based on that. So I think that's a re really interesting quote from Aswat that he uh, gives an NVIDIA that uh, not benefit of the doubt, but like rather he uh, gives it a premium because he knows they're, they're going to be on top of the next thing. I mean... When NVIDIA was trading in 2013 at like two bucks, suddenly the Bitcoin craze started, the stock started to rise up with it. They took advantage, they started offering uh, GPUs for that specific purpose. They sold a lot. They were on top of the AI trend and he expected them to be on top of the next trend as well and benefit from that. So really interesting. Yeah. I mean, he did also say that NVIDIA is the most expensive one of the of the Magnificent 7. Um, to, yeah. uh, not, not so long ago plus also i think la last year but he was still holding so we'll, we'll give yeah. him that um quickly <laughs> answering this question why only four percent allocation um because the other position above it uh, as you will see are strong companies that have been holding for a while so they grew and uh Panatier is quite new ish considering uh, handing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, considering the other companies are called Meta, Amazon, Tesla, and they make up uh, close to 50%, um, you can understand why it's now just four. Hopefully, uh, I'll get better opportunities to add in the future and increase that. Um, but yeah, Arnie asks you, what premium would you give uh, Palantir extra because of what you just said? I'm, I'm not give, giving it any premium right now because uh, the concept is still new to me. I, I you know just because uh the like most uh, renowned professor of valuation says something <laughs> doesn't mean that I have to copy that immediately I mean it's it's food for thought I listen to us mm -hmm. and as as I listen to a lot of other great investors just to like uh tick, tickle my brain a bit because at the end of the day I'm not looking to copy them I'm looking to learn what I can and make my own philosophies out of that if I like deem it valuable and that quote is really interesting so I would be curious to see if Arnie is giving a Palantir some premium and how much uh due to that reason or any similar reasons uh because it's a really interesting quote I think yeah no, I agree I think also Nvidia and Palantir are both trading if we look at EV2 sales at around the same number 18 times or something which some might say is not cheap at all um but yeah i mean it's interesting times with regards to to what we're doing what we're having right now with ai some say it's the, like the dot-com bubble some say it's a couple of years before the dot-com bubble um because things are moving quite fast these days yes you've got companies that don't do anything and still get the the positive effects of the ai hypes then you have got other companies like mostly the big tech companies and great software companies that are actually producing the goods already generating billions in in cash and profits so yeah it's it's interesting um i think the times of 
investing and sitting back and seeing, oh, we've got time, we've got a couple of years, maybe decades until something will change are, are over. I mean, the internet already accelerated things, but now I think we're in an, we're in a period where, where things can change quite quite fast. Not everything, but but a lot of things. Um, we've got an answer here by Arnie. I just care of not paying stupid premiums rather than applying premiums. It's also a sound philosophy to have. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, you, you mentioned something interesting, like they're trading at this price to sales and it's not uh, cheap at all. I mean, it's interesting because I never look at any pricing metric. I mean, I only look at intrinsic value. So I hear people say like, well, this stock is over or undervalued. And then they will mention a pricing metric like price to sales or PE or any other pricing me metric mm -hmm. as a re reference. Uh, but that's not related to value. I mean, it's related to current market price. It says nothing about value. So when you say it's overvalued at this PE, I mean, you're not re referencing value, you're referencing price. Um, yes. And the market price pricing can vary a lot. Today, a 15 PE might be like, oh, it's cheap for this revenue growth. And tomorrow that PE might be expensive. And you can say that it's cheap or expensive because it's a pricing metric, but you can't say like it's over or undervalued um, because it only takes into account three factors, right? It's growth, it's the cash flows, and it's the risk associated with those cash flows. Mm -hmm. I mean, future cash flows. Uh, so I completely ignore pricing because I have no faith in my ability to gauge market pricing and uh, trying to stay on top of that trend. So I purely focus on valuing businesses and deriving intrinsic value. So I'm completely detached from when, when you said that it's trading at the same price to sales. I, I had no idea. I don't even know the price to sales or PE of uh, Palantir. And it makes no difference to me because I'm investing based on value and not mm -hmm. pricing. So I think, uh, as you mentioned, we are in a much faster moving uh, public market and much is because of people look at pricing and make uh, decisions based on what pricing metrics are acceptable or unacceptable today and they move quickly so it's really detached from my own approach which is more slow and methodical i mean it takes a lot of time to value a business so i understand that not many people care to do it i mean many professionals simply focus on pricing metrics as well because you don't have time. I mean, let's say you have a portfolio of 50 to 60 stocks, yep. average fund manager, you're not going to sit and value 50 to 60 companies uh, on a quarterly basis. You, you don't have that time. I mean, even if you have analysts, um, it's simply not e efficient and you need to stay on top of uh, the current market conditions of so people default to pricing. So my approach is very different from that. I, I strictly focus on value. Yeah, no, fair point. I mean, it's probably also one of the reasons why last time you did, uh, you got $12, then you switched it up, you got 18, um, which yeah. again. We is, make is... mistakes and we find out things about the businesses, but it's in, it's important to like know what you're paying and what you're getting for that. When mm -hmm. I pay um, up to $12, I know what I'm expecting to get for that uh, $12 per share. Uh, when you buy simply based off of a pricing metric, you have no idea what the company is going to do in the future. I mean, uh, for example, if you are purchasing based on uh, free cash flow yield, you might buy a company like Palantir in Q4 when all the customers uh, mm -hmm. are paying their contracts and suddenly you see a shoot up and you buy a company. Let's not say it's Palantir, let's say it's whatever. And you have no understanding of that business. I mean, you've put yourself in, into a trap. So I think there's ups and downs to both approaches. I know it's my approach. Uh, there are definitely issues. I mean, you will never be precise. We can only try to be as accurate as we can be yeah. with the information we have. Accurate is different from precise. Precise is no one. No one will ever get mm -hmm. like revenue growth correctly for five to 10 years in the future or more or cash flows or any other thing like no one will get that 
precisely when they make a valuation, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to be as accurate as we can to try to un understand where our company is going. So I'm not ashamed that I missed something valuing it. I mean, it will happen. Uh, it's uh, hopefully not with PayPal. <laughs> 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 we, we can get into that next if you want yeah. if you feel finished with palantir um yeah no, for sure if someone has questions about palantir let us know in the chat if not we're going to jump into the the next one which is probably still i think you would say undervalued on both sides uh, value and pricing um but yeah. yeah paypal what did you make of of the last uh, quarter and maybe even earnings call because earnings call, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, you yeah, it was, uh, it. Um, it was underwhelming. Uh, but I'm, I'm not really sure what they were going for. But in general, when, when it comes to Palantir, I've been, I was like, I don't know if it's around the summer or Q2 of 2023. That's when I started to get hyped about PayPal. I'm like, oh my God, I'm seeing something extraordinary here. I've never came across this in public markets before. Something is very wrong here and I'm going to take advantage. And then I wrote down my thesis. It was on X at the time. Mm -hmm. I've since then published a Seeking Alpha article summarizing many of my ideas. Uh, and people are so uh, upset at me. Uh, <laughs> As if it was like, their money. I mean, uh, people are like, oh my God, you are so wrong. The stock isn't moving. I'm like, where was I wrong so far? Uh, you know, investors often act as if they are fund managers having clients breathing down their necks. They need to see price movement immediately. Uh, and as a fund manager, your time horizon is as short as your least patient client. And people are, are acting like that. They are. They want price appreciation immediately after purchasing a security and they're in such a rush to make gains which also increases the risk of mistakes yep uh, when when it comes to paypal i published a tweet saying that even if paypal doesn't grow at all for the coming 10 years it's undervalued like if you assume that the revenue growth is at 0% cash flow growth is at 0% then oh, PayPal is currently fairly valued. Uh, did you say something? Is this run, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So even if you assume zero growth, it's roughly fairly valued. Like if PayPal does nothing, like it will lose market share, it will like do nothing for 10 years. It's still like roughly fairly valued, which means that there's not much room for me to be wrong here. I mean, as long as they find any type of growth, like you can mention risk like uh, Apple Pay is eating their lunch, uh, whatever. I mean, I've heard it all. Yeah. Uh, I'm still likely to be right here and will make gains on this stock. But I saw this with, with uh, Palantir as well. When Palantir was like trading uh, above intrinsic value, people were like, Oh my God, it's just trading sideways. Uh, why doesn't it moon? And people don't understand, I, like, I don't get these people because you want price to appreciate uh, only if you, you don't know what you own. So you're scared. So you need that like uh, recognition of like, oh, I made a good decision because the price went, went up. That's yeah, but that's only only because you want to sell. That's the thing. You want yeah, it to go up because you want to get out. So that's the other point. If you want to exit, you want the stock price to go up. But if you are investing, like what's the problem with the stock price being under fair value, allowing you to purchase more of it? Like I never saw that. Like I mentioned like in a Palantir Discord, which, which is fantastic in terms of re research, but I was like, man, I would be so happy if Palantir was back at seven. Like yep. it was it was at seven for this many months. So why didn't you buy? I was like, I did buy. It was one hundred percent of my portfolio. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Like no, no, it, it needs to go up now. And it was a huge thing on Twitter as well. Like some large figures in the Palantir community were like really lashing out and and upset. I'm like, 
like i don't see the issue like you you're only desperate if you don't know what you have so you need that recognition or you're looking to exit if you're actually looking to invest you shouldn't mind the price being below fair value because it allows you to gain larger ownership and i feel the same with paypal now people are so like it's a trash company they reported earnings the stock price didn't go up i'm like why should i be scared uh, because the question i asked myself after q4 after q3 after q2 did my thesis change no they're doing what i'm expecting them to do which which is not overnight become this huge growth company that's gonna blow everyone out of the water i uh, the next question is has intrinsic va value changed meaning the output of my valuation no mm -hmm. it's still the same even assuming the new information that we now have as of q4 so why should i be scared or why am i wrong so when when people write me oh my god you were so wrong on paypal i'm like okay can you show me where I, where i was wrong and they're like, only because the, the price hasn't gone yeah, yeah the stock price did, didn't go up you're wrong i'm like this <laughs> like it doesn't really phase me at all uh and to be fair there are a lot of risks associated with paypal uh some are overblown some are less talked about uh, for example, uh, they are losing overall market share of digital payments. Mm -hmm. Still, they're roughly a quarter of global digital payments is PayPal. My valuation model assumes them to lose market share. Like I'm not assuming them to grow market share or stay. I'm assuming they will lose market share. And uh, I still see like 100% upside from here. I mean, I mean, like, I really account for a lot of execution risk. Uh, I account for loss of market share. I account for new products not being rolled out quickly enough to have impact on revenues and margins. I mean, we know that take rate is a major issue with PayPal. Mm -hmm. I, I already assume all of that in my valuation model so i'm like okay show me where, where i was wrong and people are like no idea actually I, th I think i'm very pessimistic in my valuation of paypal i think there's significant more upside than i'm already seeing which which is roughly somewhere like 100 uh, percent increase i don't have a new valuation model to present i'm still working on it uh i'm still working with the q4 results but we know that they have a moat, in my opinion. And people don't understand this moat and they don't think that PayPal has a moat. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put this question to you. Do you think that PayPal has a moat and what's the moat? Because I think this is really interesting. And uh, will uh, if you understand this aspect of PayPal, I think you're gonna uncover a lot of hidden details that you might have overlooked. Yeah, so to me, the strength for PayPal and arguably the mode there is probably the brand, the trust, security that it offers, and arguably the, the data it has from its merchants, from its users. Um, when you are as big as PayPal, I think that should give that should give investors already some signs of, okay, this isn't really a business you can replicate overnight, despite other huge players in the market growing faster, fine. But overall, in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the whole PayPal ecosystem, which should become better over time, I hope so. Um, I think that's one of the biggest, one of their biggest uh, strategic advantages. Of course, over time, our thesis can be completely wrong, execution fails, and the investment doesn't make any sense anymore. Fine, but that's where paying the right price, I would say, comes in, because. Now at what I don't know, 50 something dollars probably. If it's over 60, I'll be surprised. But the, the risk reward here favors the, the rewards at this time. Yeah, I agree. I think uh the most part is the data. I think they mentioned something like I, I don't have the exact number, but roughly like 30% or so of all issued credit cards worldwide is registered in their data vault and uh, we, we we can speak on how they will le leverage that but i think a major as you mentioned they have the whole recognition customers trust them 
and that's huge as well because um i don't know if you track any super investors do you uh, i did see yeah, two videos about uh super investors but i From didn't see a lot <laughs> like two him videos. yeah yeah, yeah no uh so uh, i i follow some super investors like because i like their philosophies and uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily to track exactly what they're doing more like why their, their thought process exactly mm -hmm. and one of my favorites is dev cantasaria he runs valley forge capital okay uh for example if you look what he did in q3 i mean each quarter uh funds filed their 13f uh, mm -hmm. SEC filings, which has all their holdings. And then you can see like, what did they sell? What did they buy? That's like wh why everyone gets hyped during earnings season, because you can see like Kathy Wood did, did this. Uh, well, she re reports every day, but uh, yeah. substitute that. Yeah, Warren Buffett, uh, yeah, yeah. people like yeah. that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I looked at Q3 at the Dev Contessari and he did nothing. Like no change to his whole portfolio. He did absolutely nothing. And I'm like, okay. I like this guy already. <laughs> Q4 comes around. He like did like uh, if Q3 was zero, like no change to anything. Q Q4 was very similar. It had like 0.1% change due to some strange region, but like he did nothing. And he has an interesting quote about uh, mo monopolies, which I think applies to PayPal, which is uh, there are different types of monopolies. There are the weak mo monopolies that are subject to be like disrupted. Is this one right? Yeah, uh, as you can see, there's no Q3 there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. He did yeah. no nothing. And when you see a fund manager do that, you know, like, okay, this guy is uh, really skilled. Uh, but yeah, and anyway, about the, the monopolies, he said there's the type that can be easily disrupted. And then you have the organic, like natural monopolies where customers want to use you. Like they don't feel that they are subjecting themselves to you. Like, well, we have no choice. Like Microsoft, for example, not a lot of users of Microsoft are really happy about their product suite, but they're tied into that ecosystem. So they're like, well, I have to use Microsoft. And that's where their mm -hmm. monopoly co comes in. And then you have uh, natural uh, organic monopolies, like let's take uh, Moody's, for example. They issue credit ratings and they charge you to uh, for each uh, rating they... Rating, yeah. Yeah. You could offer that service for free. And companies have tried, like they offer a credit rating for free just to gain market share and people will still use Moody's because, because it's Moody's. Yeah. And the base, like the trust, the recognition of a Moody's rating is much higher, but also the credit you can issue against the rating mm -hmm. is like several uh, basis points higher than uh, a less trusted one. So that's like a natural organic monopoly where you want to use them. And I've talked to a lot of business owners in regards to PayPal. I mean, we know that conversion rates are, uh, to my understanding, the best in the world when it comes to online checkout. Like, we know that they have more uptime than any other like wide scale solution. We know that uh, the latency is lower than all the competitors. So there's like some incentive for you to use them. And also there's where, where the moat comes in. They have their whole, their, their vast uh, data vault where they store like basically every information that's GDPR compliant, they have the data mm -hmm. on each customer, which uh, allows them to issue like all these new features like we heard about in this, uh, what, what first did you say? look event. Yeah, change the first the event that's going to change the world. Shock yeah. the world, shock the world, sorry. Shock. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> ex exactly. They can do that because they have all this customer data where as a customer, you can like get targeted by companies with stuff that actually interests you because they know your spending habits. And it's vastly more valuable to merchants because they can do that targeting, for example, in terms of ads. But mm -hmm. it, it's not only ads, they offer so much capabilities just tied to this. For example, uh, in their checkout process, uh, 
let's say that you have uh, two cards that you buy things with. You, you own a business, you have a business card, and then you have a personal card where you buy personal stuff. So usually when you buy computers, let's say, they know that you use your business card when you purchase this type mm -hmm. of equipment because it's likely that that's what you're purchasing it for. So it will default to your business card. But when you buy this other thing, it's going to be on your personal card. So they make all those assumptions about you because they know so much about you, making like each checkout experience as frictionless as possible. They've talked about one-click checkouts for a long time where basically it fetches all the data, all the card information, everything, and you just... Uh, use face recognition and that's it yep. and like they, they they can do all of these things just because they have this whole vast data vault that they call it and it enables them to do some really impressive things with ai that uh, alex chris spoke about and i think um, as they roll out the problem is they have a lot of legacy systems out there uh most people associate paypal with just a checkout like when i check out i can use paypal as an option or i can mm -hmm. log into my paypal account and pay for something like from some marketplace i can transfer money or something like that but a large volume of money goes through their checkout system uh, infrastructure yeah where you, where you can check out with any card or Apple Pay or Google Pay, and they get um, a fee every, every time you do that. I lost my train of thought. It's getting late here. Uh, what was I saying? <laughs> You're probably going to the it? direction of, of margins, uh, the products uh, that people don't know about PayPal because it's oh, not yeah, yeah. visible. To yeah, uh, people uh, only think that they have the checkout and they care so much mm -hmm. about that. but the data vault will make the infrastructure like the the checkout solutions so attractive that i think it's gonna form a, some sort of uh, organic monopoly that dev Cantasaria speaks about that's why i m mentioned him and his philosophy mm -hmm. re re regarding uh, uh, monopolies i think paypal is growing into that where there's like a symbiosis between you want to use paypal uh, because it benefits you and it benefits the customer and making it as frictionless as possible for all parties involved. And PayPal get, get, gets money from that. And the issue has been like, we've heard about this for over a year now. Uh, for example, PayPal complete payments for yeah. small to medium sized businesses. And then they have the like more adaptable, uh, uh, what's it called? The, uh, the solution for large businesses at the... Uh, uh... Why oh, can't? Why am I blanking? Wait, uh, let me. It's. Oh my God! Do we have a crossroads in the chat? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I can't believe this. I've I've studied this so much. Why 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 am I blanking? On this? So wait, there is PPCP, the brain tree. Brain tree. Uh, thank you, thank yeah. you. Brain tree. Yeah. So so brain tree is uh, the uh, large scale solution that, for example, uh, Uber uses. Like you can do so much. You can brand it. You can adapt it way more. But PayPal Complete Solutions, uh, which they are now starting to roll out to small and medium sized businesses, which has mm -hmm. a lot of these advanced capabilities, it's been really halted because PayPal has been around for a long time now. They've powered like infrastructure for a long time. So many of the systems out there are legacy systems. And, you know, when you run a business, you can't just like uh, drop the whole uh, payments infrastructure. Like, yeah, let me. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Like, yeah, so they can't roll PPCP, uh, PayPal Complete Payments out as quickly as they want to because the legacy solutions need to be taken offline for that. And as a business, you don't really want your payment no. solution to go offline because you're losing sales. You're getting frustrated customers. They're going to go to a competitor. So that's been their issue with getting that out there. I think they have a solution in place for that now with like zero, or I mean, close to zero downtime. Mm -hmm. And once they are onboarded to the modern solutions, where they can start to offer all these amazing AI capabilities, integrate them into the vault and all these things, uh, they can also update it uh, 
uh, seamlessly w- w- without like uh, taking the whole system offline. So I think yeah. just just like with Palantir, I think there's some paradigm shift coming for the PayPal uh, checkout infrastructure systems as well, which is not being given any credit by the market. I'm not even using it in my model, like specifically giving it some uh, extreme revenue growth rate or market share gain from that. Uh, As I mentioned, even when I'm pessimistic and have them lose market share, I still think PayPal is like trading at half of where it should be. I see like 100% increase. So yeah, that's an interesting dynamic that I think a lot of people are overlooking. And I think it can grow to be really dominant in the whole payments market. Yeah, I mean, I said it after the earnings call, I think it came six months too early for Alex Chris. Um, People still forget that he's only here a quarter and a half or so as CEO, and they're already blaming him for for the performance, which I think is completely nuts. Um, It just shows, I think he knows that when you, I heard the the earnings call. You probably read it, or maybe you heard it as well. But the the enthusiasm that we were used to was not there at all. I think he he noticed how much work there's still to do. Uh, yeah, inside, Q3 inside. to Q4 was a, like a big contrast. Like we had all yes. these promises. Like we're gonna be transparent. We're gonna change the company, and then like well, nothing changed for Q4. You're like. <laughs> So, so yeah, yeah he's, he said he like over-promised, under-delivers. Now I think he's doing the opposite. He's uh, under-promising mm-hmm. and hopefully over-delivering. I think he brought over a lot of senior staff that he's uh, familiar with. I think just recently we had uh, someone from Square come over. I mean, Yeah, today, he's a really, new marketing guy. He's really restructuring this business. And, and, and I think it's good. Uh, there was a lot of criticisms towards like how many employees PayPal has. I mean, if you look at employee efficiency, simply taking the revenue and dividing it by number of mm-hmm. employees, I mean, they are not bad at all. I mean, they are similar to MasterCard, which is like a really loved company. People think it's a fantastic business. They are under Visa, but I mean, they're way better than Square and other competitors. So it's not a disaster, but just that he's making changes. He is cutting the workforce. He is bettering margins i mean he promised they're gonna have growth not only in revenue but he's also gonna expand margins i think he said like we we deserve to expand our margins we're not gonna participate in this race to the bottom which is a fair criticism i mean we have three big players in the checkout solutions game we have stripe uh, agent and paypal there -hmm. are some more but those, those are the main three and People speculate that, well, this is a race to the bottom. It's whoever can be the cheapest is the one who's going to like win in this space. And um, I think uh, when he says that, no, we deserve to expand our margins. And the way they're going to do that is by being such an attractive solution. For example, with the whole vault thing, the AI solutions and like making it a symbiosis, like a organic monopoly. So I think... Um, He's really confident in that. Uh, what are your thoughts on this whole race to the bottom uh, argument? No, I mean, I mean, I can understand it. Uh, it's ov- obviously why margins have been hit as well. Um, but if you look at Adian, for example, they they don't want to participate in the race to the bottom either. Their margins are very, very good. Um, they're growing. They're expanding. So if they can do it, why why should PayPal be racing to the bottom? It just doesn't make Make much sense to me. I think now with the increased focus with Alex Chris, with his experience with small to medium-sized businesses, and now PayPal's extreme focus, it looks like an extreme focus towards that that segment of the market. Um, why not? Why not increase margins? Um, of course, it takes time. PayPal is not a small company. Their systems yeah. are not yeah. small. Things will will take will take time. I, I didn't think they would be changing much in a quarter and a half. Some people did think, but it just didn't make any sense. Um, but yeah, I think 2024 yeah. is is going to be a, a big year for them, um, especially exiting 2024. I expect them to be much stronger than, than what we've seen in the last two quarters. But execution is key. In this case, it's all about execution. It's, it's not about wishful thinking or anything else. Um, they can talk nicely, have nice events, etc., but they don't execute. 
uh, nothing will happen so far. I mean, he's he's been hiring the right people, I think, making the right changes, just give him a bit more time. Yeah, I have a good good impression of him. And as you mentioned, it's not like uh, Palantir where they have this whole vast space unlocking for them as each day passes. So all we can do now is like try to imagine uh, where is Palantir in 10 years? It's going to be so massive. I mean, PayPal is already more or less mature. They are losing market share. It's, I think, assuming that they're going to gain market share is really risky so it's as you mentioned it's about execution now and it's not fair to alex chris i mean how much change can you really implement in two years when you had the previous ceo sit for 10 years and put you into this position so i think he's making the right moves i have faith in him like from what i've seen and heard i think he's making positive changes but i mean my investment thesis isn't relying on him to turn around this whole business and make it into like some juggernaut. As I mentioned, I'm very pessimistic in my assumptions. Yeah. And I still think that PayPal is a huge buy. Like I've never, I very rarely see a company of that size be able to like stay stagnant for 10 years and it's still a buy. I mean, it's insane. I, I don't know if in my lifetime I will ever come across a similar situation. So I'm confident in having a large position in PayPal here. Of course, I'm not really, of, of course, I want them to do more. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, of course, I got disappointed when I listened uh, or read the earnings call. You're right. I prefer reading. <laughs> <Play Yeah. notes. laughs> uh, Trust me, it was better to read than to hear. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, uh, there's some hope of uh, outperformance. But, I mean, even with, without it, even if they would be under Dan Schulman, uh in his dinosaur ways, uh, hmm. not really. They 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 started the transformation as as I mentioned, like a year ago. So it's not like all Cr Alex Chris ideas. I think a lot of these ideas were in the pipeline. But I mean, mm -hmm. still, uh, it's crazy to see an opportunity like this. So I'm very confident in my in investment. So I revalue it every time. There's a reason to revalue. Usually during. Uh, quarterly reports or if there's a huge event or announcement uh, I will revisit my thesis several times per year and as far as I can see for right now uh, I'm not wrong despite the price not going to the moon I have an expectancy of it doing that when I have no idea but yeah I, I'm really um, uh, I'm, I'm sleeping well with the large uh, percent of my portfolio in PayPal. I mean, they haven't given me any reason not to, even though the excitement isn't there that some people might expect. Because mm -hmm. my PayPal article on Seeking Alpha had like such immense, I mean, I was like top two on the top article list. Yeah. And I was like insane. And every time I tweeted about it, I got like, I have a tweet. I think it was like, like close to 1 million impressions, like um, over a thousand likes, like a lot of engagement for PayPal. So I think a lot of people's expectations were misplaced uh, and they misunderstand the company. Because if you read discussions like on X, it's all about this narrow mindset. As we talked about, people think like you check out with PayPal and you send money, like who, who uses this shit? And, <laughs> and uh, someone told me, I haven't used PayPal in like 10 years. This is a dinosaur. I was like, have you shopped online in the past 10 years? Like odds are you, <laughs> you've used it. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's misunderstood and I'm here to take advantage of the misunderstanding because this is an um, insane opportunity. Yeah, no, I, I think it's also a mix with some big YouTubers talking about PayPal without we're just putting price targets and big numbers in their thumbnails and everybody's like oh okay this thing will 2x tomorrow okay no yeah. it's not a crypto coin um but the, the my question is because i i had this question with arnie as well when you talked about uh, robin hood at around it was always around eight to ten dollars now it's close to 16. i'm pretty happy with how that turned out but for a while we're, we were saying what what are we missing because because it was like 
very very strange why why it should be trading at eight nine dollars or so so always asked are we missing something are we missing something so my question here is are we missing something with with paypal that that we aren't seeing and that the market is seeing why is it so extremely undervalued underappreciated uh <laughs> With Palantir, we could be missing a lot, uh, misunderstanding a lot, taking out a lot more risk than we should by buying it at these levels. As for PayPal, uh, of course, wh whenever you get an output of a valuation model that's so much higher than where it's trading, the first question is like, why? For example, I have an article on, on Virtu. Mm -hmm. You can do the same exercise where it's like zero growth. And you will get like a 3x on, on the stock. Hmm. So Plus a dividend. Yourself, yeah, dividend they bought back like 20% of the company. Like they're doing all these things. But you're, you're like, okay, why is my valuation like three times where it's trading? Like something is wrong here. And it's always good to ask yourself that question. In the case of Vertu, Projecting revenue for Virtu is like trying to time the market because they are a market maker. They yep. market make around 25% of all US equity. So when you purchase on Robinhood, it's going through Virtu and they're getting money from that. When there's a lot of trading or a lot of volatility, they make a lot of money. And when there isn't, they don't make money. So like when you try quarter. to like uh, make a DCF model where you look at like uh, five or 10 years out, it's like you are pre uh, timing to try time the market for 10 years in a row. You're like, what the fuck? So yeah. You're predicting the weather. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there are some difficulties depending on which company you're looking at. For PayPal, I really, I, I've not come across any reason for me missing something I, th I think it's purely sentiment i think we're seeing a lot of companies trade outside of their value range purely on sentiment i mean we talked about the ai hype mm -hmm. we talked about um like bitcoin miners going up 100 uh, in one day and then declining 50 the next day and then going up 300 i mean it's a lot of sentiment right now and i think Throughout 2023, just fintech was out of fashion. Is my take. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't track markets like really closely. But I think they simply didn't have any major catalyst to break out of that. I think uh, they didn't re report anything crazy that would take them out of the like bad cycle. So I think it's just sentiment, and sometimes sentiment can create these strange uh, market opportunities or strange market risks uh that's not uh, like based in reality and i think paypal is probably one of those cases where the, the sentiment is was just bad and there hasn't been a clear reason for why it shouldn't be that bad so it's trading here like sideways uh, i don't think it's rooted in like missing something in the valuation of the company yeah that's my I mean, take yeah no um because we look like for the last week square block reported um of course different type of company different growth growth cycle growth numbers as well so they just better guidance they initiated better guidance than expected stock went up 15 percent um people are like oh why couldn't alex chris do this it's different different companies different player um growth wise if you looked at block they're, they're growing faster than 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 paypal because look at the size look at the market they're playing it's 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 a bit of a different story so yeah the narrative the narrative can change quite quickly. Suddenly there I mean, is a quarter. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'm not an expert on Square. I didn't study it deeply. But when I look, uh, the direct comparison we have here is Venmo against Cash App, right? Mm -hmm. Which is uh, Square's main product. I think Venmo is growing faster than Cash App if you look at uh, um, the payment volumes. Square is growing like... 80 or 85 percent of square is purely bitcoin uh if i remember correctly from reading their financial revenue uh, wise yeah yeah exactly yeah. so i think uh, like yeah, gross profit is is only two percent two three percent uh, bitcoin yeah so when people look and make those comparisons like look square is growing so fast but if you actually look at the comparables which is cash up against venmo uh and purely look at the, like the the ptp uh 
comparison. I think mm-hmm. Venmo is going faster than the last time I, I checked. So, yeah, it's really skewed, but the, the market doesn't care. They just want the, uh, as we talked about, the quick and easy uh, headline. Gains, and yeah. they uh, trade off, off of that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, Arnie, 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 Arnie is correct there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, it can change very, very quickly, as we've seen with plenty of companies. Uh, I remember Meta also. People say Meta is dead when it was at $90, 80 something. Meta is dead. Then suddenly back to a free cash flow machine. Um, and the stock is up four or five times or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know when that will happen with PayPal, but it, in my opinion, it will happen. Just a matter of, of when, not, not if. Um, yeah, do you do you have any thoughts on I don't know if you cover Baba? I don't know why. Out of topic. There's a question here about Baba, but I I don't know if you're following that company. Uh, no, uh, I don't know how I should probably uh, properly value Chinese companies because they have a completely different risk profile. Mm-hmm. Uh, like when you purchase stock in baba like you don't actually own it they are subject to the whims of the cccp not for uh ccp <laughs> not uh, not PayPal, uh soviet. Agreement. <laughs> yeah not soviet or but the soviet China. union yeah <laughs> uh, there are a, a lot of risks associated with that uh my understanding is that baba is probably trading cheap but I don't uh, have a take on it and I stay away from Chinese stocks because I have an issue valuing in it uh, because a core um, input in a valuation model is risk. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to model risk for Chinese companies. And yeah. I'm not really interested in uh, partaking in there because usually you want to move into markets that have a high GDP growth. China for a long time like eclipsed US GDP growth mm-hmm. by a lot, like 3x. Like they were at uh, 7%, 6%, 5%. Yeah. But, but then you ask yourself, like, are these reported numbers correct? Are they <laughs> actually growing? How much is tied to real, real estate? We, we all know about the dead cities in China, like whole cities built, but not nothing in them. Like nothing, yeah. how much of the GDP is tied to that? And there are so many questions that I can't wrap my head around. So yeah, no words on Baba. You could probably trade it if you're a trader. I don't know. But yeah, mm-hmm. I stay away uh, because I focus on uh, uh, intrinsic value of businesses. So yeah, I'm not confident in that. Okay, fair enough. Um... So if, if anyone has other questions, let us know in the chat. In the meantime, so your biggest ideas, let's say, are now PayPal number one in the going, I mean, going we're already two months in, almost three months in 2024, probably still PayPal number one, uh, would say Palantir number two, or is there someone else at the number two currently? I'm actually starting to look into Tesla a bit. Uh... Hmm. Historically, I've never looked at Tesla. I've never tried valuing it. Me and Arnie, like we just spoke about, like the narrative for Tesla is really bad now. Yes. So I was like, oh, oh, okay. for all EVs, for all EVs right now. Yeah, but I mean, Musk is uh, making crazy moves, uh, saying things he probably shouldn't, uh, focusing on different businesses unrelated to Tesla. Like all the whole narrative is so bad. Mm-hmm. So I ask, uh, I discuss it with, with Arnie, and I ask him, uh, yeah, we should look into Tesla. Can you share with me like uh, what you've done so far? He's like, I know nothing. <laughs> I'm like, me neither. <laughs> so we had the, like a workshop. We sat down to like like three four hours, just started to map out like, okay, what are the core business parts of Tesla that that we need to un- understand and. Uh, w- what's the market missing like in, in terms of the future? I mean, we spoke about uh, the charging network, the bot, the implications of FSD. Like we did uh, some uh, research and I'm beginning to start my evaluation process and my understanding of Tesla. I'm still, uh, I, I know Tesla headline wise. I know 
all the different parts of their business, but I can't model out what they're going to do in five to 10 years. Like, for example, they just greenlit building out Me Mexico. What, what's that going to mean for, for their CapEx the coming two years? Like, there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that I need to understand before I can, like, uh, uh, talk about valuation of Tesla or be confident in taking a huge position. Uh, for now, I did something that I shouldn't do. I was undisciplined hmm. and I bought Tesla shares at like 180, like a small position. Mm -hmm. I usually never touch a single share unless I'm like, here's my valuation. It's trading below and uh, I'm, um, I'm expecting I'm some upside. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I just did something on Im impulse. Uh, my wife is a for Forex trader, I actually. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Most people probably don't know. But I hate charts. I never look at charts. Uh, I get a quote after I value a business and that's that. And I usually don't even look uh, until it's uh, time to value it again. Or I see it in my Twitter feed. Usually these days you can see like extreme movements like being echoed by everyone. But yeah, my, my wife is a Forex trader. She has outperformed me on Palantir. <laughs> I think she has shares in the fives. If you can believe that, uh, she's up like some crazy amount on Palantir. She's up like three X on AMD. Uh, so she enters positions uh, completely unrelated to my pr process, and we have arguments uh, at home regarding uh, her charting mm -hmm. and my hate for charts. But uh, she entered Tesla, and it was in combination with me getting interest for it so i just started a small position even though i know i shouldn't do that before i'm fully done but yeah uh moving forwards i hope i can share some insights into tesla sim similar to what i've been sharing on palantir paypal where to uh there are more companies i track i usually focus a lot on uh, mafia companies mm -hmm. Me, me and Arnie call them mafia companies, this type of like really like you have no choice but to use these companies. FICO type of companies. FICO, Moody's, uh, S&P Global, uh, BlackRock, uh, Gartner. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, there's a whole list. Uh, the problem with those is that they're always trading expensive. Yeah. So it's like your life goal to just sit and wait like 30 40 years whenever you see a, like a pullback you just buy them and hold forever because they are always trading like pull, pull up a chart of fico from the 80s and then look to today it's just like it, it like never drops so uh yeah they are really interesting category of companies and i want to identify and purchase that that type of company so yeah, I hope to be able to share more on Seeking Alpha uh, and Twitter. So it's actually but, uh, impressive I, the chart of FICO. It's incredible. Yes. Start in the eighties and then just like scroll to 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 the right to present day. It like mm -hmm. it almost never goes down. So you have you have to buy them opportunistically, and I'm willing to wait my lifetime and buy whenever I can. I mean, even still, since the pandemic lows, 2020, March 2020, it's up 540%. Yeah, they are very impressive. And the market cap isn't really that that crazy either. Uh, and they like this tall boot type of companies are so mm -hmm. impressive to me. Uh, I hate one type of business that I rather never own. And it's everything that's consumer facing. Uh, companies that rely on consumer behavior, be it like, uh, let's say that you're a brand. One bad headline or a celebrity wearing a different brand can shift like focus from you overnight. And then I mean, your I business is in tatters. Mm. I don't know that Aber brand actually. Abercrombie and Fitch. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're doing well if you bought that stock, right? I saw you tweet about it. It's in insane. I, I mean. Well, what do you think about this brand? The Palantir brand, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I heard about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, but yeah, anything consumer facing, I stay away from uh, because yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't trust co consumers. But people who, r rather than use customers but abuse them, uh, infra infrastructurally, like PayPal, 
uh, I like that type of business or toll booth com com companies where you're you're forced to use them, like say a FICO, a Moody's, uh, SMP Global. That type of business is really interesting to me. So uh, I really like to study that type of business. And uh, sometimes I hope to get lucky and buy shares uh, close to fair value. Uh, happens rarely. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Okay. I mean, with with Tesla, I would say good luck with the evaluation of uh, FSD and, and the bot. It's a lot of assumptions. I mean, with the bot, we have st still very, very yeah. close to nothing with regards to but, information. But, Hopefully, we'll get this year. Uh, yeah, but remember the, the talk we had about Palantir. Like, we will never be precise. We, we, we can only try to be as accurate as we can with the information we have. I think, uh, luckily, Tesla is so well covered that any type of data that, my, that I'm curious about, I can usually find, which is really nice when you're studying a company. I think when I studied Virtu, I found like a university paper on uh, how Virtu guarantees profit every day from the amount of trades they do, because they're also like, a, what what are they called? Like hyper traders or uh, no, high frequency uh, traders. High frequency, trader. yeah. 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 So if they execute more than a hundred thousand trades per day, they are guaranteed to profit. And there was like this whole like math calculation, like it was like his final paper. He really wanted to impress <laughs> with that. And I found it like on you, you know, when you go and Google something and then you click like eight pages down, and you're like, <laughs> what, what is this? <laughs> so yeah, that that's the process trying to study virtue when it comes to tesla like i really have an easy time finding uh data points that i'm curious about not specifically about tesla but also like if i'm curious about a market uh that they operate in i can find the mm -hmm. data uh within that i, I can see spend uh, i can see a lot of competitor data i can see like i, I can make yeah. a really good analysis so uh and when it comes to Tesla, when you put, put out your valuation, or let's say that I write a Seeking Alpha article on t Tesla, and I say, well, my fair price is 180, let's say. 50% of people are going to hate me and say, I'm crazy. <laughs> You're missing everything. You don't understand this company. And the other 50% is going to be, oh, my God, you're so crazy. It's too high. Tesla is, is only worth this much. So, like, you can't mm -hmm. win with Tesla, I feel like, but I still think like uh, it's an interesting company, and uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to un uncover there. And I know that you like Tesla, so hopefully uh, we can have some uh, discussions about that as well. Pri yeah, no, for or, sure. Uh, it's... Publicly, if, if you want, to, once I have some meat on my bones in regards to Tesla. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. It's it's a very interesting company. It's funny because yesterday or two days ago, there is an analyst, um, Gary, an analyst, a money manager, Gary Black, very, very uh, known yeah. person on, in the Tesla community because he tweets more than he works. I, I have a feeling. Um, like but yeah, Elon. he's, yeah, <laughs> but at least Elon made hundreds of billions of dollars in shareholder uh, value and, and company values. But yeah, Gary said basically, yeah. Uh, Tesla doesn't put out enough information with regards to FSD and the Optimus robot, so analysts, so Wall Street cannot value it. And yet here you are telling me that you have ways to find out um, how, how to value it or how to make assumptions, which I, which is exactly what I wrote him. I was like, isn't that the job of the analyst? That's their job, not to make yeah, yeah, but, most uh, accurate have, assumptions. Have you noticed something? Uh, I used to have access to analyst projections for a lot of metrics and you will find something interesting that they all uh, converge into a similar value you don't see anyone like be way out there either a lot above or a lot below they all below. have like similar things so yeah i think gary black is waiting for someone to make some projections and then everyone to make the same one like yeah yeah, oh, yeah this this makes sense this makes sense yeah uh, uh... Which, which is an interesting dynamic when it comes to sell side analysts on wall street i i think uh just changing topic briefly do you know about snowflake the company i know i think they they report earnings this week or next week <clears throat> oh i'll do that 
Uh, that's, I think, yeah. Yeah, uh, it was often a comparison to Palantir. To Palantir, yeah, yeah. So I looked at Snowflake. And at the time, I had access to all the analyst projections for Snowflake. And also Snowflake provides a guidance like targets five years out, like they are ex expecting to hit this revenue by this year. And then they really mm -hmm. put out like pro projections. So they were similar to Wall Street's projections. So they just look at what Snowflake say themselves, adds a bit on top and, that, and that's their own. So I made a DCF valuation using like all the Wall Street assumptions. So I don't make anything up myself. I just take it straight from Wall Street, their own uh, projections. And I got a fair value of uh, $55 per share, which is below I IPO price by more than half. But this uh, same... yeah, the price is at 210 right now. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but that's using their own assumptions. Like I didn't make anything up. I just input their own assumptions into a mm -hmm. model and, and that's the output. But then you look at their own price targets. There's, there's like 180. I'm like, how the fuck? Like you give me your assumptions and uh, you're like tripling the value. <laughs> like how does this work? And then I had a talk with, with Arnie, which is a former analyst. And we came to the conclusion that the difference between Palantir and Snowflake was that Snowflake made an IPO and they sold it to their banking clients for 120 per share, which was the IPO price. How can you turn to the banking clients and say like, well, we sold you this for 120, but it's actually only worth $50. Like they will feel scammed. So of course they can't just straight up say that. So they have to tweak like, uh, discount rates like to some extreme values or whatever to justify their price targets but uh that's the difference because palantir did a dpo and really yep. like uh, laughed in wall street's face if they did an ipo i think the narrative around palantir would be much greater at a much earlier stage uh, than it is now where they only have like Barian and the knives uh talking on the earnings call so it's an interesting dynamic and it made me really like ignore sell side analyst price targets completely because it makes no sense most of the times their projections are often rooted in like some safe value they all converge to the same uh roughly towards the end and yeah so i don't really track anything sell side analysts say these days um uh, try to derive my own assumptions. Uh, sometimes I will compare my own numbers to analysts just to see like, am I way off? Are they way off? Mm -hmm. uh, if they are way higher, I think like, okay, am I missing something or are they missing something? So it's a good like uh, e exercise, but all in all, I don't put much uh, value in their opinion at all. Yeah, just not fair. How that dynamic plays out. Most of the time, it's it's basically price driving sentiment, whether it's on the way up or on the way down. Um, I remember when Rivian went public, um, it was in a hundred billion of dollars in market cap, which made zero sense. All the price targets, 130, including Dan Ives, 130, 150, whatever. And then the stock crashes to, to what, 20, 20 something. Now it's at $10. And the price targets are now 30, 20, 15. I was like, uh, wait. The company now is actually a bit better than before, but now your price target is only a tenth of what it was before. I mean, how does that work out? It's uh Yeah, it's a funny how, thing. how can your Palantir price target change from five to 20 like overnight? And uh, that's also a thing with Palantir because I did the same that I did with uh, Snowflake. Uh, where I put the analyst projections into a model and I got some crazy low value. Uh, but the analyst pri actual price targets were like, uh, I think it was Ma Mariana. They had like Palantir doing like 3.3 uh, .3 billion in 2025. Mm -hmm. This was like uh, a year ago, but her price target was 18. But if you assume the growth she put, it's like, 
around uh, 18 to 20 percent revenue growth but your like your price target implies like over 30 percent growth like uh, how how do you make sense of this so yeah it's uh, really like the effort spent trying to understand how they derive these price targets is better spent on just studying the company or yourself because uh, as you mentioned it's just sentiment driven i mean we, we all saw the upgrades uh, for palantir when palantir became in and hot to invest in uh, as of q4 they had like 70 percent commercial revenue growth and suddenly everyone's like oh my god this is insane when in actuality if you look like uh if you made the the comparison to q4 of 2022 we'd see like well 70 percent is a bit misguided uh, mm -hmm. perhaps so yeah, yeah. i i it, my recommendation would be to use the time you would spend uh, trying to understand the sell side analyst to actually research you, yourself. I think it's uh, one good piece of advice I can leave you with. Uh. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, uh, for those interested, Snowflake reports on, on Wednesday. So it would be interesting. I mean, the growth rates are, are, are impressive, not going to lie, but yeah, it's... Uh, it's not cheap and then then again analysts will do what analysts do so we'll see um to answer here no we're not <clears throat> going to talk about unity earnings i see it's down 17 percent are you okay. guys not playing unity i never play any <laughs> earnings yeah <clears throat> it's quite volatile actually I, actually I i did do something crazy uh for palantir uh they had an earnings, I don't remember if it was Q2 or Q3, but I bought a levered instrument, like 15X leverage. It was mm. when Palantir was like eight, so it must have been uh, for Q2 or Q1 earnings. It, it was in 2023, I, I don't know exactly, but Palantir was like at eight. And I was like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be stupid today. I know I should, mm. you know, no one should do this, but I was like, I, I, never, I, I, I never use call options. I never bother doing anything, but I have a good like gut feeling about today. So I bought a 15 X levered instrument and I made like 400% on that play. And I, I, I tried it by 10 X leveraging Nvidia short mm -hmm. <laughs> in, uh, uh, because I was like, well, mm. I, I did this once. I, I was stupid, so I might be lucky. Uh, so I did a 10x short on NVIDIA for like uh, Q2 earnings last year. Lost every single penny, and that was the lesson <laughs> I, I needed to forget about everything short term. You're going to stick to your process. You're not going to be like... Uh, tempted to like follow any hype or trends or you're, you're gonna stick to your valuation process and that's that i really needed to eat shit from i was sorry for the word choice uh i i really needed to take a bad loss and i got that from shorting nvidia i lost 100 percent of my money 10x as fast <laughs> yeah so uh, i mean earnings when you play the earnings uh, on the earnings game, you either hit big or miss big. It's uh, there's no there's no in between here. So um, yeah, that's the lesson I also earned. I also learned once. Uh, I tried to to time to trade, <laughs> didn't go my way. Um, okay, lesson learned. You pay for lessons anyways. No lesson is free. So yeah, yeah. But, but but it's a bit embarrassing because uh, like you get some uh, when you've been in the markets for a long time. You've never really taken outsized risks. You've never been stupid. And then as you're as mature as you're ever going to be, you make a decision. I mean, not as you're ever going to be, but as you are, like after several years of investing, you're like, I'm going to play earnings. And <laughs> like, what a stupid idea. Uh, that yeah, was for I mean, me. I mean, yeah. people may make a living doing that. And I'm not like saying it's bad or whatever. But for me, it was definitely a bad idea. I did it with Palantir. I made large gains. And then I lost it all on NVIDIA and learned that and learned my lesson, which I already knew doing it like this is wrong. I think, um, you know, Stan, uh, Stanley Druckenmiller. Druckenmiller, yeah. He has a quote like that where he's like, he took a risk and he's like, 
and they asked him so what what did you learn from that he said i didn't learn a single thing because i already mm -hmm. knew before doing it that i shouldn't do it so i didn't learn a single thing and that's how i felt losing all my money on shorting nvidia i was like i i didn't really learn anything i already knew this was a stupid idea i think i wrote it to arnie like arnie i'm making a huge mistake now <laughs> i'm i'm being so stupid now <laughs> i was like i didn't learn anything but yeah it was a good reminder at least too yeah it's like Vegas, you know, you know, if you win one hand, you know, you, you might yeah, not yeah. go out of the casino winner anyways. Um, but yeah, well, we live, we live and learn. Um, anyways, if, if anyone wants to add, if you want to add anything, if someone wants to ask a question, now is the, now is the time for those interested. Unity is down 17%, Hims is up 15%, uh, might cover that with regards to new, uh, might do a separate video later on but with regards to palantir um we've got a question here with regards to palantir titan what did they they said q2 no q2 announcement the decision will be made i think um, yeah i think some people track that really closely i'm very excited for the titan contract i mean it should go to palantir there aren't really anyone else running i know we have that other uh defense prime buying for it together with uh i forgot the the partnerships but it really looks like and and real and palantir will win titan mm -hmm. uh, they've been dropping hints about it like everywhere in their demos in their youtube videos they have like uh, sneak uh, titan text on some chairs and like it's it's been a gag for a long time now uh we don't know exactly when it's gonna drop it's like with the nhs contract you you knew palantir would win but they like dragged it out for years it feels like titan has been on the table for years now uh but i do think it's already valued uh in the stock price uh, that doesn't mean that the stock won't appreciate on the news it could but from a valuation perspective i think it's already valued in i mean i certainly already valued it in but yeah the stock could explode on that uh, I, I, I don't know what the stock price does day to day mm. or in terms of pricing, but yeah, valuation wise, I already valued it. Yeah. And purely from, I mean, purely going forward, I think it's a good recognition wise. It's good for Palantir if they win it, uh, regardless of what the stock price will do. It's good for, for future contract negotiations and stuff like that. Uh, whatever happens with the stock price, we don't know, can go up, can be a sell the news type of type of thing as well. Uh, remains to be seen with so regards to curiosity, i think raytheon was one of the other runners i forgot who they teamed up with uh, was it like c3ai or something stupid i think it was hmm. well, <laughs> so we're we're raytheon and some other... <laughs> yeah so yeah they they should win. It, it should be in the bag yeah yeah uh any update on the s p inclusion no our guess is it's as good as yours i think yeah i think they have like if it's quarterly or by yearly uh, that they make like the board makes the decisions in regards to this i think some people have spoken about march being one of those dates and some people are expecting it to happen in march it's also another thing that will have uh effect on stock price i don't know mm -hmm. historically what s p inclusion does to, to stock prices i'm not really worried about it more than i hope it gives me an opportunity to buy more shares at the undervalued price but yeah uh, i think um, the board makes decisions like two or four times per year and people are expecting them to accept palantir in march yeah could be i mean it's definitely not yeah, the only one that, that, could, could that will be included or, uh, so yeah exactly there are yeah. plenty of other companies on the list as well so yeah remains to be seen uh, but definitely something to to watch out for um yeah anyways thank you all for joining Emir. thank you for for coming on the channel um we'll definitely have you back whenever you you're ready to talk uh, tesla i'm sure it's going to be a very interesting uh, research journey because of everything that they're doing um yeah. may maybe by the time you're you're done with your article Ila, and we'll be like oh, maybe we should go into this type of industry and suddenly everything changes but uh yes i think it's a challenge yeah, yeah right now i think with the auto energy fsd and robot you have uh, enough uh, enough to work with um Ro robot taxis uh, everything yeah so yeah lot. 
charging network, that's where the hidden value is. Tr trust me. Me, me and Arnie are co convinced on the charging network. The charging network is a big, uh, it's a big one. I don't know how much money they, they, they can make from it eventually, but it's a. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different aspects to that business. I mean, it's really fascinating when you when you think about it. But yeah, as you mentioned, that's the type of company that you have to give this uh, NVIDIA premium to almost because you you never know what they're going to pull out. But you know that whatever en endeavor they enter, they are uh, forced to be reckoned with. I think the Aswat made some comment about Amazon that uh, Amazon can enter any business they want mm -hmm. he does he, he doesn't know if they're gonna win in in that business endeavor but he knows that he's got they're gonna make everyone else lose any business they enter they're gonna make everyone else lose like uh, <laughs> so yeah it's a really interesting dynamic that some companies have i think tesla is one, one of those unpredictable ones that really have a lot uh, of sur surprises throughout one's uh, investment journey in that company and yeah I'm looking forward to talking about it with you, someone who knows Tesla far better than I do. Uh, but hopefully we can have some discussions when I understand it, uh, when I've scratched the surface a bit more. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, as always, thank you all for joining. Thanks, Amir, and uh, we'll see you all in the next one.